Father, thank you for the time that we've been able to chat, drink tea, coffee, water, juice. We're able to connect with people who we know and who we don't know. Lord, I want to pray for us now as we read your word that we connect with what you are saying to us. Help us to comprehend, understand, take on board and live out what we learn this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, teaching. Now, for those who are members of this church, um, you will know that we are meant to be converting to... Converting. Uh, we are meant to be... That went badly. This goes well for the rest of the morning. Right, so... <laughs> huh? No, going to New Living Translation version of the Bible. Change. Thank you, Carol. Well done. Change. Yes. We have been talking so far all year. And as Carleen very pointed out, the first month is already gone, uh, basically. But we are in a process of change. And one of those is we were going to go to the New Living Translation and it was going to be displayed on the screen and it's all going to be wonderful. Didn't work this morning. So my sermon is based around the New Living Translation. So if you've got Bible apps and you want to go to the New Living Translation version, version that will be great. Please do. If you've got the Move Bible and you can carry on running through that, NIV, they're pretty much the same. But please bear with me if I don't look like I'm using quite the same translation that you're using. Is that okay? It's going to have to be. I don't mean that rudely. It's just going to have to be. Um, and I will get it sorted for my teaching next Sunday, and it will work. I mean it, by God's grace. So a few weeks ago, when I was looking at 2015 going forward, God, you know, what uh, maybe you want me to take on board, take us through some teaching material. Well, 1 Corinthians came to mind. <laughs> no, 1 Corinthians came to mind. So um, it's 1 Corinthians. So if you'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to do chapter 1, and we're not going to do the whole of chapter 1, because we need to get ourselves in the Corinthian mindset. Are you up for that? Are you up for trying to be Corinthians this morning? I know, that's what I thought. Thank you, John. Very dangerous. So we're going to need to stick ourselves in the Corinthian mindset. So if you could all change your clothing, please. Oh, no, okay, we won't do that. But we're going to try and, 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 and be Corinthians. We're going to have to imagine ourselves there. Imagine the sights, the sounds, the smells. Um, can you do that? Excellent. It stinks, by the way, in Corinth. I just thought I'd mention this. So, um, not now, probably. I'm talking 2,000 years ago. But we're going to. Who's up to 1 Corinthians? So, it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. We all know that. And you see in verse 1, it's also from our brother Sosthenes, who more than likely was the scribe who was writing as Paul was talking. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, which actually is a makeup of a group of house churches. But Paul is saying, but you're one church. Do you get the thing? Your one church. I mean, we have some house groups that meet during the week, but you're all part of Greenford Baptist Church. So you're one church in, in that respect. And then subsequently, Greenford Baptist Church is part of the international church, is it not? I was last week um, speaking at Holy Cross down the road, and so speaking there with my fellow brothers and sisters, and we really were, felt sort of one sense of one church. And uh, just to let you know, I had a great time. I, I enjoyed every second of it there. It was great. It was brilliant. It's a great time to be there. So let's try and get ourselves into the mindset of being in Corinth. And we are going to get some background and try and get some imagination of what it's like to be in Corinth. Not as the church, but in the city itself. So are you ready for that? 
So we're going to read the history of Corinth, and we're going to try and see it from their point of view. And I'm going to go through, and I will admit this, I have taken a photocopy of the commentary. It makes my life a lot easier. It means I haven't had to spend half an hour typing it all out. But let's try and go there. So Corinth, or Greek Corinth, had existed for some several hundred years before it was destroyed by Rome in 146 BC. Okay? So 146 years before the birth of Jesus, give or take four years, it got destroyed by the Romans. So you think you're a city that's existed for several hundred years. You're been very prominent within the Greek culture, full of knowledge, full of learned stuff got an ancient history to you, you got wiped out. Okay? Became ruins. But then the city was refounded by Julius Caesar, that great known character from the Asterix comics, in 44 BC. And if you have no idea who Asterix is, where have you been? I believe that Obelix existed. And he had a little dog. But that great Julius Caesar came along and rebuilt you in 44 BC. And we quickly rose to prominence again, didn't we? Yay! Come on, you've got to imagine, you're there. You're, you're a Corinthian. Come on. So we've riven to prominence again. That's it. Fantastic. Let's imagine ourselves there. And we've become one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. We're big people. We're prominent. Whoa, we're powerful. We got it. We're there. And also Corinth was the capital of the province of Acacia and the seat of the governor. Fantastic. Look at that. We got it all. And actually, some ancient geographer, Strabo, attributed the city's economic success to its strategic location. We're in the right place, basically. We can't argue. We're situated on a narrow neck of land that connected the Peloponnese to the south with the rest of Greece to the north. To the east and west, respectively, with the Sidonic and Corinthian gulfs of the Argaean and the Ionian seas. The distance between the two bodies of water becoming only nine kilometers, which in money I can understand is about six miles. Not a lot of neck of land. And a paved road was built to enable boats to be dragged the short distance from one piece of sea to the other piece of sea so that the boats didn't need to travel round the dangerous point at the end to get round the other side. So there'd be some of us in here today who would have and will be very strong because we drag boats for a living. Oh, come on, get with it. You drag boats for a living. Yeah. Oh. See, I told you Obelix existed. See, look at the size of him. So... So actually, you know, for Corinth, we were sorted. It's like a toll bridge, isn't it, really? It's like the M25, you know. You've got no option. You either do the dangerous route and the long-winded route, or you pay your money. It's like travelling from here to Wales. You even go up and round Birmingham and sort of trip across, or you take the short route right across the old seven bridge and you're sorted, but you've still got to pay your money to get across, haven't you? Same thing. So makes lots of money on tolls. Brilliant. Well wealthy. And just to let you know that that... Toll roads still exist, but at some point in 1923, even though they've been discussing it since 602 BC, you with me? As back as 602 BC, they started discussing the idea of carving a canal. It finally came to fruition in 1923. Politics is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I think that's quite fascinating. I found that fun. But it finally happened, and even to this day, it is used, that canal route between the two gulfs, is actually used as a shipping route now, today. I just love it to think today we can look at that and go, oh, I know about that. 
That happened in Jesus' time. Not the actual canal bit, but the fact that was being used as a road. Something tangible, something to touch, something to say. What the Bible has to say is real. I like that. So we're famous, folks. And at some point, some archaeology digs in 1886 are going to happen, and they're going to discover that we are a remarkable city. They're going to know lots about us. Yay! You're written in the history books. I, I don't feel you're Corinthians yet. <laughs> you're meant to be getting vaguely excited about this point. You've, you've, you've got some history to your name. Don't try. Listen, work on it a bit better, all right? Let's, let's actually do some genuineness here. So Roman Corinth, by the time we get to Paul's day, is prosperous, wealthy, lots of money. We're rich. You can't serve both God and mammon. We're rich. No, 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 no. no. You can't serve both God and mammon. We're rich. Praise the Lord. And we're cosmopolitan. We're made up of a mixed bag of people from different continents and different arenas. Oh, look at yourselves, everyone. I think you're more Corinthian than you realize. We're very cosmopolitan. We take on people's other cultures. We take on people, board other people's opinions. We take on board people's fashion statements. And maybe for some of us, we need to take on board others a lot quicker. A joke, I don't mean it, goodness me. Just trying to be funny. I won't bother. But we're very cosmopolitan. And we take on, we appreciate each other's culture and understanding of things. We love learning from each other. Isn't that good? We have places where you can talk and learn and say, well, back in my home country, this is how we view the world or this is how we view this situation. And we learn and we bounce. Oh, we're becoming such a multicultural city. Isn't it wonderful? We're also religiously pluralistic. And I still can't get my word, lips around those words. But we take on any culture, any religion, Bring it on board into Corinth, it's fine. Bring it on. Yes, you believe that, that's great. I believe, I will I'll respect your beliefs. Come on in. Yes, there's no one religion that's truly true. Let's take it on board. This is Corinth. This is Greenford. Not Baptist Church. Better not be. But this is Greenford. This is Northolt. Is it not? We take on, now in our society, any belief. And you have to respect it, which is fine. But to, we sometimes push it now to the point of, well, you can't speak up for truth. Everything's true because it's your truth, which is a load of <clears throat> rubbish. But this is Corinth. Any religion on board, that's fantastic. Come on in. We'll accept it. We'll take it on board and we'll take it as it is. And also in Corinth, we are used to visits by impressive, travelling public speakers. Oh, no. But it's true. They, we are used to anybody coming in and peddling their ideas and peddling their knowledge, and we pay them for it. Even though it could be a load of baloney. If you don't know what baloney is, talk to somebody later on. If, even if it's a load of rubbish. But we're used to these impressive speakers who seem to absolutely expound wonderfulness for us to hear and go, wow, they're brilliant. We in Corinth are so accepting, so tolerating of everybody else. Are you feel like a Corinthian now a little bit? Do you understand it? It's more like how we are in Greenford. Who's our impressive speakers today? <clears throat> I'm not talking about me. But bless you, anybody that said, oh, you, Warren. That'd be great, thanks. No, later on. Who's our, in thank you, Carol. The politicians are our impressive speakers out there, aren't they? Yeah, oh, there's tons of them. Yeah, all right, thanks, Carol. Carol's a rhetorical question. It's like, no, but you're good. No, thank you, keep going. Anybody, uh, no, no, I said keep going. It's great. Archbishop Canterbury, yes. But we have a mixed bag. We have those who I believe are, yes, they're speaking God's word. They're impressive. And then those who clearly aren't. 
yet 90% of the population probably take on board what they're saying. Corinth, no different. We, no different. Are you feeling more like Corinthians now? Do you understand? There is amazing parallels. Basically, our world hasn't changed. It's the same. So you're Corinthians, yes? Fantastic. You're obsessed with status. Oh, there's silence there. You're obsessed with status. You're standing in society. We are obsessed with it as a town of Corinth. We're obsessed with self-promotion. No, I'm not standing here self-promoting myself, but we are obsessed with self-promotion. I want to push myself forward, my ideas, who I am. You want to know my name. We as Corinthians are obsessed with that as well. Our society is like that, believe it or not. Hate to tell you this. So is most Christians underneath have little glimmers of ego occasionally. I include myself in that statement. We can all be sucked in by it in one form or another. And as Corinthians, we are obsessed with personal rights. Don't spill. Personal rights, it's my right. It's my right to have this job. It's my right to have the promotion. It's my right to park my car outside my front door. It's my right to have that parking space in supermarket. It's my right to have a refund immediately. Just because I dropped it, it's not my fault. We're obsessed with personal rights. It's all about me in Corinth. Ooh, what does that sound like? Sounds like Greenford. Thank you, Auntie Bosse. Sounds like Greenford. We're obsessed with personal rights. Now, as good Christians, or if you're in Corinth, maybe a good Jew, you would look at Corinth as a pagan city. You look at it as a pagan city and you'll note that its inhabitants are marked by the worship of idols. And these days, idols take many forms, as we know. Sexual immorality and greed. Sounds so much like Greenford. North Alt, London, UK, worldwide, wherever. Doesn't it? And we're living in this Corinth, this Greenford. So do you feel more like Corinthians now? Their world is no different from ours. Oh yes, we have drainage toilets that flush internally and things like that. But actually, the society makeup, the cultural makeup, is no different from what we have today. And this is the church to which Paul is writing to. <laughs> just as a sideline, just to make you even more, um, Paul laboured as a tent maker in the nearby biannual Ithacum Games, which is only second nature to the Olympic Games. I just laughed at that given 2012. We had the Olympic Games down the road. And Paul basically was a tent maker there to the biannual games. It, just for me, just that correlation. If we want to appreciate that we are more and more like Corinth as a society now, that should say it to you. That's sort of fine. I like that idea. Anyway, there you go. Was, I appreciated that. So, do you feel like Corinthians now? A little bit. When you walk outside, look at our society. When you look inside, look at our society. But when you look outside, look at our society. So this letter may be have written 2,000 years ago, but it has a lot to say into us today. 
It actually has a lot to say about our society and about us and how we live our lives today. So I don't know how long at the moment this is going to take us. This could take us months. It could take us the whole year to get through this letter. So I hope you're going to be enthusiastic about it as I was as I have read it. You with me so far? Excellent. I knew we was only going to get through the background and the greetings this morning. We weren't going to be able to get through anything else. So 1 Corinthians isn't really 1 Corinthians. It's 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians isn't really 2 Corinthians. It's 4 Corinthians. Yeah, I'll catch up. Let me explain why. Very simply. We will note in 1 Corinthians, when we get to it, in about chapter 5, verse 9, Paul makes reference to the letter he wrote to them prior. So we know there must be at least one letter prior to 1 Corinthians. So that really makes it 2 Corinthians. Because there's a 1 Corinthians we don't have. Okay? And we also will then note in 2 Corinthians, I'm just telling you this, in 2 Corinthians, he makes reference to the letter he wrote that is clearly not 1 Corinthians, because it's got none of the content as such from 1 Corinthians that he's answering. It's in 1 Corinthians. So there's clearly at least a 3 Corinthians that we haven't got. So 2 Corinthians is really 4 Corinthians. Okay? So when I say 1 Corinthians, I mean 1 Corinthians in the Bible, but in reality, it's really 2 Corinthians. Okay, with me? Excellent. Good. But we'll just stick with 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians as it is in the Bible. But I thought you'd like to know. Because when we get to chapter 5 and you say, but Pastor Warren, you lied to us. You're saying this is 1 Corinthians. There is obviously another Corinthians. It's, you're with me. Good. Now, the reason for the letter. Oh, actually, yeah. The reason for the letter. Um, well, because we don't have... Because we have a lost letter, we don't really know some of the things that Paul is going to talk about. We don't understand what some of the questions have been or what he previously wrote to them. Reason being, chapters 1 to 6 seem to be him dealing with some oral um, misunderstandings that he's heard about, which could have well been generated by the letter he sent. And then the rest of the Corinthians, him in then dealing with the issues that they wrote to him about. So we don't have their letter to him, and we don't have the original letter to them, okay? It, so when we, as always, when we read the epistles, when we read the letters, we have to almost like it's another end of the telephone conversation. We're not hearing the other part of the conversation, okay? Are you with me on that? It's like me this week going into London and having a lady on the other end sitting opposite me, clearly with a phone on, chatting away to a friend and going on and on and on about stuff. And I was getting really frustrated. She wasn't particularly shouting. I don't know about you, but I find that annoying, people sitting on the mobile phone forever, chatting away at one end. And it's not because I think, I think you're being dead rude to me, but it's the fact that I want to know what the other person's saying. <laughs> I want to make sense of the conversation. It made no sense. I want to know. You know, don't mind two people sitting next to each other on a train chatting away because you get the flow of the conversation, don't you? <laughs> I do because I'm dead nosy. But you get that flow going on. Okay? But with well, this lady, she, she was... Da -da -da, and I was like, I just want to know. What's being said the other end? <laughs> and I don't wish to give anything away about her identity or anything like that, but I do hope you got invited to that wedding. whose ever's it was, out of the three. I picked up about that much. <laughs> Bless her. She wasn't being rude at all. It just, uh, it just <laughs> one of those things. So we have to listen, try and listen, when we go through this letter over the next coming months, is listen to the other half of the conversation. It's called mirror reading in technical terms, but there you go. So... Why did Paul write the letter? Well, some believe that the main point of the letter is about unity of the believers at church, in the church. It's about holding them in unity. It's about talking to them about unifying as a church, coming together as a body of believers. Which on one level is absolutely true. That clearly is in there. That's one of Paul's main emphases as he's writing. There's obviously some factions, and we'll be looking at that, funny enough, at uh, next week. We'll be looking at that, or starting to look at that. But it sort of laces itself all the way through the letter. Uh, this sort of needing to have some unity. But 
as we go through 1 Corinthians, we will notice Paul making lots of reference to the Old Testament in various formats, the odd verse or the odd view. So he's as a good Jewish writer, writing, by the way, sorry, I forgot to say this, to a Gentile, mainly Gentile church. He is trying to show them uh, what I would consider the bigger picture. Paul clearly has a bigger picture in mind related that he would do as a good Jew from the Old Testament. He's almost looking at the church through the lens of the Old Testament to give them a bigger picture. You with me so far? So it's not just about living in harmony. It's much bigger than that. And we see that as we go. So it's not just about unity of the church. So don't sit here and think, I'm just going to be banging on for 16 chapters about us being unified as a church. I'm hoping that's not too much of a problem for us. I hope, GBC, that's not too much of a problem for us. Good, excellent, okay. Don't know, by the time we get to 16, we might have theological arguments over things, and it might be, but, but that's the whole point. So it's a much bigger picture. I like to refer it to more sort of what Paul's trying to do. Rather than 1 Corinthians being restoration man, it's more grand designs. Yeah, basically, yeah. More, less restoration man. And if anybody knows what I'm talking about, who knows what I'm talking about? Restoration man's George Clark. Come on. Ladies, hands up. Everybody likes to do a car for some reason. George Clark, restoration room, building something just to keep it go. Or you've got the Kevin version, grand designs. And that's what I think, the bigger picture. And that's how I say it. You can tell what I like watching. So I'm going to run through very four very quick notes of, uh, that came out of the commentary, that I, particular commentary I was reading at this point. These are the four points, and I'm going to highlight them now as the overall arching theme running through everything. So guess what? You're going to have to remember all of this for months. Okay, good. Thank you. Cheers, John. I'm glad somebody was up. Because actually, one of the key phrases for me, and I'm going to say this now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, says, do everything to the glory of God. And I think that is the overarching theme for me. Everything's got to be done to the glory of God. Everything, everything you do, everything that is about our lives is to the glory of God. So, ready? This is probably Paul's four extractions out of this. Proclamation of death and resurrection of Jesus. Submitting to unity in Christ and living out the wisdom of the other person-centered lifestyle of the cross. I.e., i.e., It's a proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which we all believe. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. It's amazing, isn't it? When I said money, we're rich, you went, yay! Death and resurrection of Jesus! Right. And also, coming out of that is actually, as Jesus lived the life of worrying about the other person, he lived for the other person. He didn't live for himself, did he? He lived for the other person. Person, And that is actually our role, as well as followers of Jesus, to live a life centred around somebody else. Not to be self-centred, to live for the other person. Now let me quantify that, because some of us then will go into panic that we need to care and love everybody else until the point that we're burnt out. No. All right, let's make that very clear. You still look after you, as it says in Philippians, you know, don't look out... um, I recite this ad infinitum. Um, yeah, don't. Oh, that always happens, doesn't it? And it begins with P, not with J. Makes a nice change. Oh, yeah, don't look also after your own interest, but look out for others. Notice the double whammy. Some of us just, oh, I just got to look out for others. Correct. But it also says don't look to your own interest as well. Oh, yeah, you still got to look to your own interests. You've got to look after you as well, because you can't help anybody else if you're not looking after you, yeah? Okay, cool. Number two, they must abandon the Gentile vice of sexual immorality to the glory of God. It's not just about giving up something and saying, no, you must not sin. It's having another focus, and it's for God's glory. 
Yeah? Okay. Number three, they must abandon the Gentile vice of idolatry and give proper worship to the one true God. Again, to the glory of God. And number four, the Gentiles' lives will be characterized by an expectant hope for the final consummation of God's glory and their own glorification in the future bodily resurrection, i.e., very quickly, number four, is the bigger picture. Our lives are meant to reflect a hope of a future of a bodily resurrection. The hope of our Jesus coming. Our hope of Jesus actually saying, that's it. It's over and done with. I'm raising you in a new body. Our lives are meant to be lived out with that hope always in mind. So, you're going to be with me for the next 20 minutes, and we're going to go through the greeting. And I'm going to do it from the New Living Translation. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sosthenes. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now there's an opener. There's a great letter opener. I don't know about you, most letters I get are, Dear Warren, hope you are well, and may I now interest you in this new credit card or insurance policy. Most emails I get bouncing to and from are, Dear Warren, I'm not knocking anybody by a bit, but it's like, Dear Warren, how are you? Da -da -da. And I'm exactly the same. I tend to write to people in, in emails, Hiya, how are you? Da -da 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 -da. This is a real sense of, I'm writing to you. God's church in Corinth. And we'll unpack what that means. And grace and peace to you. Oh, I just think it's a great letter opener. But it's not unusual. The format is not unusual. It's quite a normal greeting style for somebody in a, a, a Greek culture, a Roman culture, the Hellenistic culture. It's actually quite an opening normal letter. I mean, what's our normal way of writing letters these days. It's the uh, address top right of who it's from, yeah? Address somewhere in the bottom left of who it's to. Then a dear this or to whom it may be concerned. That's so personal. And then read the subject. And then the letter, isn't it, being written. It's the same letter. It's the same way of doing a letter. It's just in there. This is their style. So it opens up with who it's from who it's to, and then something about them and who they are. But it's a standard sort of opening greeting. It's not any different, and we're going to come to the rest of the greeting in a moment. The problem is, we tend to read the opening greetings in the letters and go, oh yeah, it's 1 Corinthians, this is just Paul talking. I know this because I've looked at the contents page to find where it is, so I know I'm reading 1 Corinthians. And we tend to then skip over the greeting completely. We almost drop down, in this case, like verse 10. Let's miss the first nine verses, because it's all the nice, it's to the church in Corinth. Don't need to know about that, I need to skip on. Yeah? Who does that? Good, oh, we're going to omit some, are we? We tend to maybe miss over the greeting and, and just keep going. Well, I've just said, and we just noted, we're more like Corinth than we realise. So what does that tell you? We should listen to the greeting and read it as it's to us. Can you do that? Cool. Excuse me, I just need to... Um... Apologies. So as I said earlier on, uh, this letter here, the opening, Paul, it's from Paul, uh, called to, an apost to be an apostle. This, no, no, it's not that, I'm reading the wrong one, I'm reading the NIV version. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus 
and from our brother Sosthenes. We don't hear about Sosthenes after this at all in this letter. So it's probably more than likely, as I said earlier on, that Sosthenes was the scribe. It's like I remember in my old job, the directors calling in their assistants, their secretaries. By the way, we have both male and female secretaries before you think I'm being sexist. But they actually called them in and would say, could you please take this down and then send the letter as I recite it to you? Yes? Same thing. Sosthenes seems to be the scribe for Paul as Paul was talking. So... What's going on? Paul actually refers to himself as what? Yeah, can you say it better than I can, please? An apostle. It's very key here. Called to be or chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul is identifying his position and function in relation to the church. Now you're going, yeah, but we know he's an apostle. But actually, he's making a very clear statement here to remember a church that is in a city that is position obsessed status obsessed and believes in self-promotion he's making a very clear demarcation about who he is in God's will he's making it very clear that he is chosen by God don't forget this is a city that's used to impressive speakers turning up promoting their own thoughts and thinking and Paul is saying I am chosen by God as an apostle. It's almost, I'm ordained by Christ Jesus to do this. So let's get this straight right from the outset that as you read this letter, it's from God. Did you see the... And we see later on, uh, next week, we'll unpack the idea that he talks about, oh, these impressive knowledge peoples, where are, he uses rhetoric to unpack it. He is saying, this is a position that has been given to me by God. This is God's will that I am an apostle. This is how I am gifted. Take note now, the rest of this letter. Now, it's very easy at that point to maybe sit there and think to yourself, well, maybe Paul's being a bit up his own backside, basically. He's making this big grand statement. He is an apostle. He's been appointed by God. So he can tell the church what they need to know. You can think, he's being a bit obnoxious, isn't he? But when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7, and... 10. I will just quickly go to it. You don't need to turn with me. I just want to show you something. It says this in uh, 115, 5 5 to 7. And uh, he's talking about Christ uh, dying and being buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them who are living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to the apostles. At last of all, he appeared to me also as as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Note that Paul is not up his own it. He's very humble about the fact he is an apostle, but he recognizes that is his gifting. That is what he's called to do. So it's a com- strange combination. Why am I going on about this? Well, We're all called to be something in God's great plan. We're all called and gifted to be something, aren't we? We're not just called to appear here, sit and be body warmers for the chairs that we're sitting on. We're gifted and called to do things. We're gifted and called by God to be somebody in his kingdom, in the grander scheme, in the grander scheme of him final consummation, him finally coming. Paul knew who he was called to be. So he exercised that gifting and that position, quite rightly, in humility, but also with the authority that he knew he had. 
Not all are called to be apostles. Not all are called to be pastors. Not all are called to be teachers, as it says. And that's not an exhaustive gift. But we're all called and gifted to be something in God's greater plan. Do you know yours? Do you know yours? And do you exercise in that? Do you recognise that and walk in that and use it? We can take it with humility, but with the authority that we know we are being given because we are appointed by God. See, there's a lot in opening greeting you don't expect, is there? Don't skip over the greetings. God has a lot to say through them. And hopefully by the time we finish the teaching on 1 Corinthians, you will know. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, he says in verse 2. To you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ, just as he did for all people everywhere. Who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. This is where he says, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. A, there's two things there. One, church, singular, unity, together. But more importantly, they're not Corinthians church. They're God's church. The church is appointed by God. The body is God's body. They are a gathering appointed by God. They're not just some club. They're actually God's club. Do you understand the awful analogy, but how else do you get around it? Not some social gathering just for the nice cakes and sweets and eats. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But you're there because they are God's club. This is him writing to the Corinthians. And guess what? That's us as well. Even though we're missionaries, that's us as well. I know some of you are suffering from jet lag and maybe bored. It's fine. But we are God's appointed church. That means so much. And we'll unpack that as the letter continues. Now, this is the more thing that I really want to pick out just for this morning. That it says here that... uh, In verse 2, I'm writing to God's church of Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by the means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Right. Called to be holy. Now, holy, the NLT is not a great rendition of that because there's another version that says sanctified. And that's the word we use quite often. Oh, I'm going through the process of sanctification, which normally means I've just really, really screwed up and I really, really sort of say, no, it's God's idea. But I want to get something here. The Greek word that got used by Paul throughout the whole of his letters, and especially in this one, about being holy, ready for this? Is a perfect passive participle, and I have no intention of ever saying that again with drink. So, I, you know, I practiced it five times in the office to get it right. It's a perfect passive participle. Grammar was never my strong point. What that basically means is, when he said that you are called to be a holy people, he says it's now. You're sanctified now. You're holy now. I knew John would like that when I was writing that out this week. You are holy Now. And if before you suddenly say, oh yeah, but he's talking to the Corinthians. Mm -mm. He says, and that is the same for everybody everywhere, whoever you are, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me, are you everywhere today? You're somewhere because you're here. So this letter is written to you. You are Holy. I'm sorry, Lord. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. You're holy. You're holy. 
No, get this. It's not about show, but get this. You are sanctified. Now, it doesn't make us perfect because in the Greek version of sanctified it actually means you're God's own possession now. God has got you now. It doesn't mean you're perfect. We talk about going through the process of sanctification. Yes, the Holy Spirit constantly works in us, tries to make us more and more Christ-like. It's absolutely true. But Jesus was God's own possession right from day dot. We are God's holy own possession now, the minute you call upon him. The minute you've become a Christian, the minute you've given your life to Jesus, you are sanctified. With me? Are you perfect? No, am I perfect? Not by a long shot. Trust me, joy will tell you. But we are holy. We are sanctified as individuals and as a church. Amen? Amen. And we'll work through the rest of that as the letter goes on. Because none of us have got it fully yet. Some have, some haven't. And it's out of that, yes, it's out of that knowledge that you are holy, that you are God's own possession, that you will live your lifestyle. It's not that you live your lifestyle trying to be better so that you get God's approval. You've got God's approval. So out of that God-driven approval, you will live your life. Do you get the point? doesn't work that you have to be perfect before God will use you. It doesn't have to be perfect before God even loves you. So it says in the Bible, you know, that he actually, while we were still sinners, he sent his only son. It didn't say, when they finally became perfect, then I finally thought, oh yeah, Jesus can come now. We just read Corinth. It's just like Greenford. He, the last thing it is, is perfect. Yet there is God's own possession, God's church in Corinth. And the God church in Corinth isn't perfect or else Paul wouldn't have to write this letter. But they're still, according to Paul, God's own. You are God's own. Can you just let that actually sink in? Bypass all the garbage that's in your head and go, yeah, but. And all the emotional rubbish, don't let those filters get in the way. Allow the Holy Spirit to just remind you that you are God's own possession. And it is out of that that you will live your life. I know I'm repeating it ad infinitum, but I can just see, I can see the other filters kicking in. Verse 3 very clearly says, grace and May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. That quantifies that end bit. It is because of grace of God that you have peace. And when you have peace, you live in the grace of God, and you live out that grace. And it just constantly goes on around and around and around. It's a, it's a never-ending circle. So for a letter opener, wow. Wow. I don't know about you, but normally when I go up to somebody and say, good morning, do you sit there thinking, grace and peace to you? You're God's own possession. Do you know who you are? Do do, you do that? I don't. doesn't get done to me, and I don't do it back. Maybe we need to remind ourselves. It does say, keep encouraging one another until the day is coming. Maybe we need to do that a bit more often, remind each other. I church I preached that a few years ago Uh, we as a church were helping out another Baptist church in the area and uh, one the church secretary always stood up and he always the church secretary always stood up and he would say good morning faithful saints I said a lot that said a lot Well, the rest of the sermon, we're not going to make in time at this rate. And that's okay. I've written it out. means it gives me left work for next Sunday. But we'll work on it for next week, okay? I don't want to go into four to nine now and the rest of the greeting. Yeah, no, that's wrong. I just want you for a minute just to sit and say, I'm God's own possession. Note this, it's like Paul the Apostle, appointed by God. It wasn't up his own backside. He understood that it was from God. So when you say, I am God's own possession, you're saying, God has made me his possession by his grace. 
yes, you initially have to make that leap forward and choose to follow him. But once you've done that, which the vast majority of in this room have done, we become God's own. And that doesn't stop. Unless you absolutely choose to completely and utterly renounce Jesus. And I mean truly. There's some days that we wake up and think, really? Have I really got to follow Jesus today? But you've got to make a categorical, absolute turning away from him, completely walk away and live an entire lifestyle knowing it's totally against him. And I don't believe there's anybody in this room that I'm looking at as a member of this church, definitely, and others in this church and, and people who follow Jesus who have done that. So you are God's own possession. So say that to yourself. I am God's possession. It may not always feel like it, but you are. Now turn to a person next to you without giggling, actually mean it convictionally and say, you are God's own possession. I bet internally your own voice was a lot louder to yourself. Encourage your sister or brother next to you and say, you are God's own possession. Bless you. You are God's own possession. It's true. You are God's own possession and you are to live out your lifestyle recognizing that. It doesn't give us an excuse to sin. It makes that very clear in the Bible. But I say it gives us an excuse. Actually, it gives us a command almost to live out that grace. To live in and out that grace. To walk out today going, I am God's own possession. Doesn't mean life doesn't touch you. Bad things don't come. Let's be honest. We know that. But we have a much bigger view, which is Paul is trying to show, a much bigger picture. So you're God's own possession. Do everything to the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, I just simply pray for every one of us in this room. Every one of us, just to actually make that a reality for us. Not something cerebral, not something in our brain that we sort of know, but something that becomes so rooted in us, so part of our DNA, that we live out the fact that we are God's own possession. That our Father looks at us and says, you're mine. You're mine as individuals and you're mine as church. And that goes for everybody everywhere who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, make it a reality, I pray, for all my brothers and sisters. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.